Welcome to the November Resident Council meeting. I'm Fran Baker, the Council President, and today we're going to begin with our committee reports. So first up is Finance with Joe Chase. <clears throat> Kim Cockengay, VP of Finance, gave the financial presentation for September to the Finance Committee in the Missouri Room on October 27, 2021. In September, there were 12 sales, which is over budget. On a year-to-date basis sales, we are ahead of budget by 14. There were 14 move-ins in September, eight of which were lease. Entrance fee proceeds are 90% of the annual goal. Leases year-to-date are well above last year. Inventory continues to be tight. Occupancy in independent living continues under budget. Occupancy in the Village Care Center is 138.50 under budget. The assisted living occupancy remains at 128 units under budget by four. VAL 400 census is 22, which is almost full. Home health activity continues unfavorable to budget, but with case mix improvement. Hospice census remains the same and averages seven under budget. During September, expenses exceeded revenue by $148,000, resulting in an operating loss. Investments for September declined, resulting in an unrealized loss of $1,030,000. One million thirty. However, year-to-date are still favorable to budget. Year-to-date operating contribution is negative at three hundred ninety-one thousand. Expenses year-to-date are still below budget, which reflects staffing vacancies. Days of cash on hand decrease slightly, but are still ahead of budget. It is in anticipated to decrease in October due to three payrolls and a bond payment. Debt service coverage ratio is favorable. Net operating margin continues below budget. Challenges. Staffing continues to be the most significant item. There was a hold on the next 12 international nurses. The largest usage of agency personnel is for CNAs in the village DCC. Use of agency personnel shows a reduction in quality while costing twice as much. Internal CNA classes are helpful in filling openings and held as fast as they fill up. The VCC continues to struggle to meet budgeted operating margins. Labor shortage is resulting in restricting admissions and thus creating a decline in census. Efforts to continue to minimize the losses and to get closer to budget. The next meeting will be held in the Missouri Room on December 1st. We're going to uh, stop, interrupt our committee reports for just a minute because Dan Rexroth is here, our CEO, and he has a few words to say to us today. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, remotely today. We uh, just came in from the outside, and boy, it has really turned to uh, fall, hasn't it? And I just... Uh, Decided I need to get my my coat out, so maybe you do too. Did wear one today, but uh, anyway, today is Monday Night Football. Chiefs playing tonight, and we're all excited about that. Um, but John Knox Village is still on the move, uh, different than the Chiefs. We feel like we're on a winning team here. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but a uh, <laughs> uh, lot of lot of things happening at the village. A uh, lot of great progress that we're making. You know we pushed through COVID, decided that uh, we weren't going to take hit the pause button, we weren't going to stand still, we were going to march right through. And so uh, as you drive around campus, hopefully you've seen a lot of improvements that we're making. Uh, some of them I know causing a little disruption before actually the progress takes place. Today, for example, we're putting the new uh, water line in. That's causing disruption for a number of you. Thank you for your patience, for your understanding. I know it's an inconvenience. Some of you are um, without water for part of the day today. And 
their city tells us there's no other way around it, uh, but that's hopefully just a one day occurrence. So uh, that uh, water line should be in by the end of the day today, or at least the part that's gonna disrupt residents. But uh, we're trying to make accommodations for that. I was over at Lakeside Grill at noon today, and they uh, didn't have an overflow crowd. I know that's gonna be open for dinner, and Caleb and his crew is gonna open that up so that uh, the Meadows residents, and really whoever wants to go, can, can go to Lakeside Grill. So, so thank you for that. We've also had some disruptions on Peace Parkway. And I drove that a couple of times today, and that's been kind of a mess the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's all in the name of improvements. There are gonna be some uh, places there, patchwork, I guess, in the next couple of weeks that's going to be uh, taken care of. Uh, there's some really bad spots. So as soon as the weather breaks, they're gonna get those repaired. That's not the final product. Uh, that will come in the spring when the Meadows 2 construction is done. Then we'll be able to finish off uh, Peace Parkway. So wait for the spring for that. Uh, and I don't know if you can call a parking lot beautiful, but I would call the parking lot along O'Brien uh, beautiful. It is uh, very attractive, and so hopefully you're enjoying that. And a lot of other construction going on in different parts of the village. So uh, thanks for uh, bearing with us. Thanks for partnering with us. And uh, appreciate your patience and understanding during these times of uh, construction. So uh, thank you. Certainly if you have any questions, you can contact me or some of the other staff are always willing to speak to your group or to answer questions. Or if you just have a simple question, uh, give us a call, shoot us an email. Uh, we're are always happy to respond. So thank you and thanks for the partnership with uh, Resident Council. We've got the best Resident Council uh, on the planet. So this is a great group. Thanks, Fran. And Dan, I know you're really, really busy, so I'm glad you were able to come by this afternoon. Uh, Martha Wood is chairman of the Health Services Committee. Martha? The Health Services Committee met on October 13th in the Administrative Boardroom. Our speaker was Melanie McGraw, social worker and JKV Care Coordination Manager. She provided the names and phone numbers of all those who can provide outreach support if needed. Melanie emphasized that as care coordinator for John Knox Village, her goal is to make sure residents can maintain their independence for as long and as successfully as possible. She is here for all residents and is working to bring new resources and the right people to the John Knox campus. For various reasons, especially COVID-19, there is a lot of demand for help to ensure the resident's mental and emotional well-being. Melanie will also provide pre-surgery counseling as there are times when questions and concerns need clarification to ease the mind prior to a procedure. Also, she can help explain what steps and information are necessary following the death or incapacitation of a spouse. It was clear she is here to help via phone, office visit, or in a resident's home. Committee members were very appreciative of this new role at John Knox Village. Anthony Colombato, Vice President of Health and Community Services, reminded us of the October 15th Aging in Place workshop at the Pavilion. Outpatient therapy is providing a prehab therapy that will prepare your body so it is in the best possible condition 
to undergo surgery and recovery. He also stressed the importance that outpatient therapy at the village deals only with seniors, not the general public. Assisted living has new admissions and will also focus on aging in place for their residents. There is consideration at the village care center as to what the optimum size should be due to increased demand for skilled services from outside John Knox Village and the current staff shortages. Village Hospice is waiting on the government as to when the seriously ill program will begin, possibly January or February. John Knox Village will be the first to have a new service. It involves an arm patch which will monitor vital signs and will react only if it senses changes outside the wearer's normal range. If that occurs, it would alert JKV security. It is well known that there are small indicators often not noticeable, which progress before a stroke, heart attack, and other conditions actually happen. This will be most beneficial to those with chronic illnesses. There are still unanswered questions as to the cost and insurance covery, but this has the potential to change the way we age, and we will hear much more about it. There is still no information as to booster shots, although we're getting them this week, or a vaccine mandate. Our next meeting will be November 10th in the administrative boardroom. Please let me know if you would like to visit. The nominating committee has no report this month, and so next we'll hear from Resident Services, Carol Jennings. Resident Services Committee met on October 11th in the boardroom. Our guests that day were Ted Hollander, Dining Services Manager, and Sarah Conniff, the new dietitian here on campus. Todd shared how the services of the JKV Dietitian Benefits residents and introduced Sarah, a four-year registered dietitian. She has experience with neurological, surgical, and physical therapy dietary needs. Sarah is available to all residents for personal nutritional counseling and is currently working with VCC and assisted living, establishing guidelines for menus and creating recipes to modify food textures for residents with dysphagia. Sarah has an intern who is working on nutritional information sheets that will be available for each restaurant. These will cover items on the menus giving calorie, protein, fat, carbs, fiber, soda content, sodium content, and some allergy considerations. Sarah is working with Chef Tim at Courtyard Cafe, developing nutritional cooking classes. She is available to all groups as a guest speaker. She can be reached at 816-347-3742. Maria reported JKV's biggest challenge is the labor market. She is concerned that many JKV associates are reaching a burnout condition. HR is offering increased wages, hiring benefits, and incentives to new hires. On the bright side, an interior design contract has been signed for new paint and carpet for F, G, and H buildings. Also, curb and sidewalk work has begun on Peace Parkway. A contract on the thrift shop will close soon the building and land where the university had been was sold to a chiropractic business. Anyone who needs to shred paperwork can take it to secure bins at the administration building, warehouse, or marketing office. 
Our next meeting will be November 8 in the administration boardroom. If you'd like to attend that meeting, please give me a call. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Anna Margaret McGuire has the report from sales and marketing. Sales, marketing, and communications committee met on October 21st in the Manhattan room at Places. Mary Bath presented the monthly sales report. September gross deposits were 13 with the goal of 13. All seven villas, phase seven, uh, were sold. Meadows two goal for deposits at the end of March 2022 is 42. Several cancellations and several deposits that will be, there will be uh, 26 by the end of October. The first Meadows 2 move-in is expected September 2022. At the end of September, there were 819 paying units campus-wide in independent living. Our speaker was Eric uh, Scott, and he spoke to us about product shortages and how the, that impacted sales and marketing. Due to incre increased lumber prices, which were 600% increase over the last year, villa construction costs increased delays in product slow building. Appliance deliveries are three months out and cabinets, windows, and doors from six to 15 weeks. Framing of Meadows 2 was halted until a new uh, water line was installed, which is happening today. Renovations has also been slowed because of, show, of slow uh, inventory. All this impacts inventory. No available units to show new clients. Villager halls and common areas will be renovated beginning in January. A contract is out for new carpet and paint in the common area of buildings F, G, and H. Despite it all, marketing continues with uh, marketing two, an expectation of having five renovated homes, duplexes to show soon. With no further business, the meeting was adjourned and meeting, next meeting will be held November the 18th in the Manhattan Room. Our speaker today is Anthony Colombato, and we've heard that he is Vice President of Health and Community Services. Anthony oversees a large area, lots of different specialties, and he's going to share some of that information today. Anthony? All right, well, good afternoon. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I've been in my role now for about five months, and so I've had the opportunity to learn a lot, to ask a lot of questions, and so we're starting to really find some opportunities for health services. Um, First and foremost, thank you to everyone that attended the Aging in Place um, workshop. We thought it was a really successful event. We had almost 200 residents show up, um, which exceeded our wildest expectations. So if you were not able to make it, good news, we are going to have another one next year, and we'll continue to have conversations about the, the services that are provided to you on campus to help you age in place successfully. So moving through some of the business units and their progress, I wanted to start with outpatient therapy. Um, coincidentally, right after the Aging in Place workshop, outpatient therapy moved to the ambassador room. So if you've not had a chance to go see it, please stop by at some point, but it is wonderful, it's beautiful, it is renovated and remodeled, and they are busy. So they have had their best month in history in October um, and we anticipate that to continue to grow as we really just tell more residents about outpatient therapy and the benefits of therapy. And so if you have any questions, feel free to give them a call and they can explain exactly what they do. As I've mentioned several times, there are things that we perceive as part of the normal aging process like pain, going to the bathroom in the middle of the night every night that are not necessarily normal parts of aging and so there is an opportunity for them to help with those things. 
So please feel free to give them a call and ask the question. They will also help get uh, your insurance coverage taken care of. They'll get an order from your physician. They'll do all the behind the scenes work and kind of help navigate through that red tape that can be so frustrating and confusing. So, um, not part of health services, but one of the other areas that we're seeing a lot of growth is with our fitness centers. At the Aging in Place workshop, we were able to demonstrate the VirtuSense VST Balance, which is a tool that will assess your balance, your gait, your movement, and it'll find potential opportunities for you to improve. Our goal is to have VST Balance be part of the mainstream culture in independent living, and that every six months you go and you get assessed and it'll tell you and track you over the course of your life and we can see if anything is changing and provide appropriate interventions, which is really exciting for us. Um, moving right along, the, uh, the biggest area that I have found so far for growth is within our Village Home Health Agency. And so right now we've done a really good job servicing a lot of the hospitals, but we do think that there are some more potential growth areas just within our own campus. And so we are, again, starting to talk about the services that home health can provide, um, and they can come directly to you. So there is no leaving your home, um, which is really ideal for a lot of our residents. We are also looking at potential growth opportunities across the Kansas City area. You will hear as I kind of go through the different business units, we are starting to see a dramatic shift from institutional care to home and community-based care. And what we're really trying to do is to bring care where you want it, not necessarily where you need it. And there's a big difference in thinking there. So we are working very hard on that. But again, just like any other service, if you have any questions or concerns, give them a call and they might have a suggestion or they might be able to pick you up on services um, and again help navigate all that red tape so that you don't have to deal with your insurance company calling the physician's office any of that stuff we will come to you Moving right along, our assisted living uh, is really also starting to, to pick up a lot of steam. We are finding that there is still a very good market for assisted living, especially one that is part of the John Knox Village family. And so we completed our renovations about two months ago. Um, and so it is beautiful. It does look like a brand new building if you come over and see it. And so we are now working on shifting to try to come up with a plan to renovate some of the apartments because we have noticed that they are dated and they do need some upgrades and so we are working on a plan that we can kind of move through that very strategically to make them more marketable to uh, the outside community. Um, also in assisted living, Marie Winter Calvillo has started as the administrator, so she's been there for about two months now and she's really making a lot of progress with associates and residents and so far I've gotten really good um, reviews about how she just is a very calm and kind and conscientious person and she's also a very effective manager. So I believe that she will be very, very successful um, at Village Assisted Living and John Knox Village. All right, moving right along, as Martha mentioned earlier, Village Hospice is waiting on the federal government and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or what we refer to as CMS, to authorize a new program called the Seriously Ill Patient Population. And what this does is it allows us to help people in our community navigate the healthcare landscape by partnering with primary care physicians for people with chronic conditions that just need help managing it. And so it is different than hospice, but we're able to use kind of our expertise in care management with hospice to really touch more lives across the community. So there are only six agencies in Kansas City that have been approved for this, so we are just waiting. There is the potential that we could start in January, and so it will allow Village Hospice to grow and grow and grow, which is something that we really want to see happen. And then I will close with the care center. So again, as Martha mentioned, the care center is kind of trying to find itself after the, you know, the, in this post-COVID world. Um, it's no secret that we lost a lot of residents at the care center last year. And there is still a market for people that need long-term care and skilled nursing, but our challenges on the labor front really restrict us from being able to admit people on a routine basis. And so we're kind of at an inflection point on, are we going to get back to the same size we once were? Are we gonna stay where we are? Or are we gonna 
decrease even further. And so we always want to make sure that we have plenty of space for our residents here on campus, but we might become less of a community uh, skilled nursing facility in the future, which is very different than how we've historically operated. So we are looking at that, but if you tie it all together, it's really changing from the care center being the focal point of healthcare on campus to the focal point being your home. And what can we do for you in your home now to help you successfully age? We know that that is where people want to remain and we have the tools right here on campus to help you do that. And so we are really just shifting the way we think about healthcare to make it more accessible and easy, but most importantly, where you want to have healthcare. And that will be our big um, opportunity moving forward and something that we are working very hard to do to ensure that you have seamless health care where you want it. So with that, I will answer any questions if there's any in the group. Yes. Yeah, very good question. So the question um, was, uh, all residents on John Knox Village have you know, suffered through the pandemic and what mental health resources do we have here on campus? Um, as Martha mentioned earlier, we have shifted someone um, into a new role as a social worker. Her name is Melanie McGraw, and she's here to help kind of connect you to those. But moving forward, to your point, we have noticed that there, we've done a really good job of getting healthcare on campus. We We've not done so well in the um, behavioral health area. And so, you know, I have heard from a lot of residents that are continuing to struggle, you know, with isolation and depression and anxiety and a lot of these issues. And so we are looking for a partner that will come on campus to deliver some of these services to our residents because, again, it is a very difficult thing to navigate and we don't want anyone to have to go outside of campus um, to find these resources. So we are working on that right now and hopefully in the next couple months we'll have identified a partner. I think the big challenge is we want to find someone that has the capacity to take on a large caseload here if that is needed. Um, I don't want to partner with an organization that just doesn't have the available um, clinicians to deliver services and then we end up with the same shortage that we're in right now. So, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, is the care center really only considering admitting John Knox Village residents? And the answer is yes. And the, the, the logic behind that is we just do not know when this labor shortage is going to end. And, you know, we've been really fortunate with the partnership with the uh, UMHR international nurses that we actually don't have a nursing shortage at the care center. But what we do have is a shortage of CNAs. And so all of our agency spend is with CNAs and those are even hard to find for us right now. And so we do have to make those considerations moving forward is what is the care center going to look like and who are we going to serve? And we know that our primary purpose is to serve our own residents but that might mean that we are no longer the community partner that we once were. But we are going through a very thorough operational review to kind of determine the future of the care center and we will be working with an outside agency to help kind of guide us along the way. Yeah, so the question was, as we look to expand some of these areas, will we have staffing to support it? And, and, and that's the goal. You know, the good thing that we have right now is we've already built the infrastructure, right? So we have all the administrative things, we have our policies and procedures, you know, we have the, the bones are ready to go. Um, and we have been a little bit more successful at finding clinicians to fill in in home health and hospice. Um, there, are, is, there are specific people that really like that type of work that do not want to work in an institutional setting like the care center. So we do believe that as we can expand, we will be able to grow and have the staff to support that. So the question was, the move of uh, outpatient therapy from the Windsor room to the ambassador room, was it because of additional space or to make it more accessible uh, to people you know, driving up? And the answer is both. Yes. So we, um, we outgrew the space that we were in and if, for those of you that have ever been to the Windsor room it's extremely difficult to find there's very little parking there's no signage so to have a very recognizable place like the ambassador room where we will be putting a nice sign out there that says village outpatient therapy um, it will make it much easier for people to come to us um, but in addition to the ambassador room, we also have the ambassador conference room and we have some private treatment areas that we did not have at the Windsor room so we it'll allow us to do more clinically 
than we could previously, which is exciting. So the question was uh, how many of our associates are vaccinated and you know where are we with getting closer to 100%? I believe and I will I would have to double check this that we are about at 70% of our associates that have been fully vaccinated. Um, there's still as you read there's still a lot of vaccine hesitancy. Um, part of this is you know with all the confusion we are waiting on the federal government to kind of tell us exactly what to do and how to do it. Um, I actually read this morning that they are getting ready to publish a rule very soon. And so that will kind of be our, our guidance for how we move forward. Um, we continue to offer vaccine clinics, clinics every other week on campus for associates. We continue to publicize that it's available and we continue to make ourselves available if anyone has any questions, including our medical director, Dr. Twinter, because I do think it's important for people to hear from physicians um, about vaccine efficacy and, and you know, alleviate some of their concerns. So we continue to push very, very hard for that. And it is, you know, something we'll continue to work on, but hopefully we will have some real guidance very, very soon. So the question is, are we doing, yeah, the question is, are we doing um, testing of unvaccinated people? And the answer is yes, we are. Um, we are required to test. The frequency depends on the county uh, positivity rate and prevalence. And so right now we are testing unvaccinated associates in both the care center and village assisted living twice a week um, in order to try to be more proactive about that. And so um, that is kind of another perk to being vaccinated is that if you are vaccinated, you don't have to be tested. And for those of you that have been tested, it's it's not fun. And so, you know, we are trying to offer as many incentives as we can, so. So the question was, how are we handling unvaccinated visitors uh, to the care center and assisted living? And unfortunately, we don't have control over that. So our residents have the right to re receive visitors and it does not matter if they've been vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, I see potential in the future where w maybe different activities that they could participate in based on if they've been vaccinated or not. But right now we're just allowing access, but they have to be masked the entire time, um, as do the residents while they visit. So, yeah. So the question is, you know, we have different neighborhoods in the care center. We have long-term care, we have memory care, and then we do have a post-acute rehab unit. Is will we continue to do rehab for post-hospital stay? And the answer is yes, we will continue to do that. We're seeing a trend across the industry where people are, and it started during COVID, where people are skipping care centers altogether to go directly home with home health. So we're now really only seeing the sickest of the sick patients that just cannot go home yet. Um, but we will continue to be that. The question is really what size is the rehab unit going to be? And it is the most labor intensive neighborhood at the care center. So we really have to be careful with that capacity because you know we have to ensure that we have the appropriate resources to manage that care. Sure, so the question is why are we continuing to wear masks at John Knox Village when other parts of the metro area are not? Um, Johnson County was specifically mentioned and I was in Johnson County this weekend. They do not have a mask mandate. Um, but we do here in Jackson County and actually as of this morning it was refreshed another three weeks. So, so we committed um, as an organization to always follow the strictest of rules that there were because we believe that it is our obligation to keep our residents and associates safe. And so we will continue to do that. If Jackson County lifts its mask mandate, I'm not sure how we'll handle that. We have not had that conversation yet, but that is certainly a topic that you know is out there. Yeah, yeah, we will we will consider, you know, how to handle that and again, you know, we want to balance, you know, keeping everyone very safe with, you know, I, I know there are a lot of people that do not want to wear the masks and so, you know, we we do respect that opinion, but you know, we we do know that masks work and that especially when everyone is masked, they are extremely effective at preventing the transmission of COVID. So yeah, yeah, no, I understand it. And it'll be interesting again as the, you know, the kind of post-mortem we do on the pandemic, you know, as we hopefully are starting to emerge from it. You know, one thing that I learned, um, you know, we never wore masks during flu season, right? And I think people forget because of just how big this pandemic has been, but we always lost 
you know, several residents each year to influenza. And I just don't see a future in which we are not wearing masks during flu season in our, you know, care center and assisted living in places like that to prevent the transmission of flu and other diseases. And so, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what all comes after this, because I think we have learned a lot about infectious disease and how it transmits. And so hopefully we'll become a better and safer society, you know, moving forward, especially to protect our most vulnerable. Sure, yeah, the question was, will we continue to have unvaccinated visitors wear masks? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that because really, uh, you know, it's different in the care center and assisted living because we have, you know, regulations that we have to follow. So, you know, a lot of the COVID, almost all of the COVID protocol, at least as it exists today, is what we are told we have to do. Um, it's a little bit different in independent living. It's also a lot harder to monitor those things. You know, we do have, you know, a, a single access point into both assisted living and the care center, which makes it a little bit easier. So, yes. So the question was, where do the regulations for the care center assisted living come from? They are different. So the care center, because they receive Medicare and Medicaid dollars, we have to follow the regulations from the federal government. Assisted living is a state licensed agency, so we follow the regulations from the state. And yes, they are different at times. And so oftentimes during the pandemic, Heather, Scott, and I would talk, and she would tend to defer to what the care center did because we were typically typically a little bit more strict than assisted living because we had to be. And so, you know, we always tried to have consistency if we could between the two business units and we still do to this day. So, yes, we were following Jackson County guidelines for independent living. However, we have also said that we would follow the recommendations of the CDC from the get go and we would tend to go with whichever one was more stringent. Um, in order to protect our residents. So. You didn't tell me there'd be so many questions. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. That was a lot of good information. Thank you. I did want to remind you about the Pride speaker, November the 9th. Ryan Lafarve is going to be the speaker, and I understand it's a very good motivational program. Also, our next uh, resident council meeting will be December the 6th, 2 o'clock, in the pavilion with live audience. We're so glad we'll get to see you in person. <laughs> this is the meeting where we um, welcome new residents. So please come and join us and welcome residents that are new the last couple of years. So we'll see you then.